This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Not to disappoint, but space aliens did not build the pyramids. And it may not have been the Egyptians' idea either. Could it be that the most revered architecture in human history came from the mind of a Hebrew slave? Mary Nell Wyatt Lee presents a biblical foundation for these legendary structures because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Despite what you've seen on TV, space aliens did not build the pyramids. However, an alien indeed, a stranger in the land, if you will, of Egypt did. More tonight as we start a brand new series, Moses and the Pharaoh, with special guest Mary Nell Wyatt Lee on Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Now, let's bring on my co-host for this evening, the social media director of A Rood Awakening International, Chris Clark. Thanks, Scott, it's great to be back. Yes, great to have you. We had you a couple of weeks ago talking about all the different platforms that people can find us on because censorship is out there. Let's just face it, this is the new, brave new world and we just have to uh, come at it head on. And some people who are doing that uh, are some folks online who have a nickname for themselves. These are, you told me about this last week, uh, Toms and Tomboys. Who are these folks and what are they doing? Well, we, we've got a community of people that uh, Hang out in the chat rooms, Michael okay. Rood's chat rooms. And uh, people are wondering, what are we supposed to call ourselves? Do we call ourselves Messianics, Hebrew Roots? Oh, that whole thing. Okay, so okay, okay. we decided to call ourselves Toms, if you're Toms. a male. Okay. Tor Observant Messianics. Okay. Or for the females, we call Tom Boys, Tor Observant Messianic Believers of Yeshua's Salvation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. So we so now these are the folks that now these are not the trolls that cause us trouble on right. these chat rooms. These are, these, are, these are the heroes of the chat room, right? Okay, very good. So you've got kind of a little club going now, okay? Right. And uh, I understand there's also a place for said club called Discord. Right. So tell what is Discord first of all? Well, Discord a pl is a platform that's built for making communities. Oh, okay, okay. So we've had, A Rude Awakening has had lots of chat rooms in the past, including uh, Chat Roll, which we call Chill Chat. Chill, yes. Because YouTube is kind of fast, so for people that don't want to deal with the fast pace, they just would hang out in Chill Chat or okay. the Chat Roll chat room. So now, YouTube being fast is because there's so many- So many people. So many people, and it just, it, it scrolls up so fast right. you can't keep up with it, is that right. it? Okay. So this is a chill chat, so this is in. Yeah. Now, how does someone get on there and go, I like to talk to people. How do I get on this Discord? What do they do? Well, uh, we set up a server. Mm -hmm. they, they call it servers on Discord. So we set up a server called Hebrew Roots Community. Okay. And then we shared a link on all of Michael's social media platforms. Oh, okay. So that people can click the invite link and be invited into the community. Okay, so if someone goes on Facebook with Michael J. Rood, uh, right. they, they'll find it, it's there somewhere. And also okay. on Michael's, uh, uh, and on the rootawakening.tv website. Um, oh, the social media page. the social media page. Okay. There's a link also for the Discord community. Okay, very good. Now let's talk about that too. You have it on your phone there. Uh, right. You've actually got that page called up. Right. And so now we were talking last week how we have uh, YouTube, Instagram we didn't talk about, but uh, I guess a lot of what is on Facebook also goes on Instagram, is that right? right? Yeah. And Twitter and... Um, what do I mean? Pinterest. Mr. Pinterest, thank you. Oh, wow, so you're, you're managing all that? Well, that's just the beginning. That's, those are the standard platforms that people have been using for years. Okay. But we, we've got 12 platforms now that we're My promoting Michael on. Okay, so let's, let's go through some on there. You've yeah. got them on your phone. And so the, the new ones, what have we got? So for the new ones, we have MeWe. What's MeWe? MeWe is an alternative to Facebook. Facebook okay. censorship has gotten bad. With the fact checking and all that nonsense. Right, okay. yeah, you, you can't post anything without a fact checker telling people you're wrong. Okay. Right? Uh, so MeWe is an alternative to Facebook. And there's no no censorship there? Well, I mean, I, I haven't seen any censorship on MeWe. Minimal, I, we if, if anything, censored, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. 
All right, and what else have we got? We've got Gab. What's Gab? Gab is, it's like an alternative to Twitter. Oh, okay, So very people good. that got censored on Twitter or banned from Twitter, they've gone to Gab. Okay. And Gab also has videos now, so people can post videos on Gab. Okay. A lot of the platforms are trying to add videos since YouTube has been censoring people. Ah. So okay. they've got Gab TV. So we're not on that yet at Rude Awakening, but that's we're heading one of the things the <laughs> sure. platform offers for Very people. Very good. Uh, any other ones we got? Oh, we've got Parler. Par- Parler's been up Parler. and down. A mm-hmm. lot of people that got booted off Twitter went to Parler, and then Parler got taken down. The platform was taken down, so they brought it back. It still has some quirks, but it's still okay. a platform that's available. Okay, so, very so good. we're there. All right. Uh, we've got CloudHub. CloudHub is like an alternative to Facebook and Twitter, and it also has videos. So okay. people that were banned from YouTube, of some of them have used uh, CloudHub. Okay. For and that, again, for we that. can anybody can sign up for any one of these. It's just a simple sign up process, like it would be for to sign up for Facebook, right? Something same, like that. Same for Facebook. You just go there, set up your username. And, uh, Put in an email or something. Right. Or, okay, very good. And, and I recommend trying to use the same username on all platforms. Uh, okay. That way people can find you and follow you on the same platforms. That's what we do for Michael. We try to do Michael J. Rude. Okay. So if you look for Michael J. Rude on any platform, people should be able to find him. Uh, another one, Brighty on Social. Okay. Uh, Telegram. With Telegram, you can have a Telegram channel. You can have Telegram group. So we, we post information there. And, and then we have fellowship. Oh, okay. And that's what we have been doing in the chat rooms. That's been basic chat, so we've done the best we could with that. But now that we have a Discord server, we're making a community that has a lot more extra benefits than a gotcha. regular chat room. And I'm sure there's more on the way. I mean, every week there seems there's a new alternative because it, people are saying, no, we want freedom. We don't want to. We don't want to be tied down by these by the current uh, tech giants, as it were. Right. Right, okay. All right, thanks for that. All right, so we'll come back in just a second. Uh, But first of all, episode one of how the pyramids were built. Here's what you're gonna see tonight. Take a look. He found these hieroglyphs. As you can see on the screen, this hieroglyph is still in use um, all through ancient Egypt, but he found some that had more detail in them, and they looked like they portrayed a part or a piece of a a piece of machinery. And then when he read what Herodotus said about how the pyramids were built, and he said they built them in steps or terraces or tiers, and this machine was used which would raise the blocks from one level to the next. And then when Ron saw this this hieroglyph that looked like a device, he started thinking, and this is a case where I believe God gave him insight. And he built this device. And so Ron built one of his own. He built many of them. And he started out with small ones. And once he got the device to work, as you can see on the screen, uh, by using nothing but wood and ropes, Four people in this in, in this particular segment right here, four people can be seen raising an automobile. It's a small automobile. Wow. But later on, after we got married, he built one um, and put our van on it. And I was scared to death. <laughs> I said, please don't tear up our car. <laughs> but four, four people. You know, he built that and four people lifted it and he did talk to an engineer who told him that based on this leverage method and uh, using ropes, even though it's wood, um, Ron is, is in the video that you'll include saying that this uh, engineer said that it could lift up to 500 tons. All right, so there we have it, Mary Nell Wyatt Lee. Uh, very exciting stuff, brand new series, and just in time for the second Shabbat of the fourth month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblically Hebrew calendar. There you see the uh, information on your screen there about the month. And speaking of the month, we have a love gift. Uh, Chris, this is the one we did with uh, Joel Richardson a little while ago called The Sign of the Son of Man. Uh, very interesting stuff, how you know the, the Jews and the Christians have very different ideas of what Messiah is supposed to look like, right? We have this conquering king that, you know, the Jews said, well, now there's a Messiah. And I think the, the Christians are gonna say, well, yeah, that's the guy we talked about the whole time. <laughs> so right. I think we're all gonna see him, you know, for who he is. But this is a very interesting uh, teaching from Joel about 
how this happens and how people are gonna recognize them. So it's very interesting. So that's our love gift for this month. Uh, also some beautiful gifts you get with that, but we won't get into details with that. We'll let the commercial right after this take care of that. So thank you for joining us today, Chris. All right. Appreciate it. Well, I think we'll have you on one more week. How about that? Sounds that good. Fair? All right, sounds good. All right, could it be that the most revered architecture in human history came from the mind of a Hebrew slave? Well, Mary Nell Wyatt Lee presents a biblical foundation for that, but first, it's the Kiddush with Michael. So go get your bread and wine and meet us, meet us back here in about two minutes. We'll see you soon. New Testament believers look forward to the second coming, while Jews look forward to their first Messiah. With such different expectations, will both groups recognize him when he comes? They know without a question that this is not only the Messiah that the Christians and the Messianic Jews have been talking about, but they also recognize that it is Yehovah God Almighty, their God. In The Sign of the Son of Man, Joel Richardson guides you through the Bible to weave a tapestry of clues that point to Yeshua as both the man resurrected and Yehovah who descends in a cloud. But the only way to watch it is to receive it as our gift. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you The Sign of the Son of Man with Joel Richardson on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you the sign of the Son of Man, plus a hand-painted ceramic kiddush cup with creator of the fruit of the vine in Hebrew. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you the sign of the Son of Man, the hand-painted ceramic kiddush cup, and a beautiful work of art with the Hebrew phrase, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. These are special gifts from Michael Rood, to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Remember, this offer ends June 30th and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. For the past 20 years, I've lived in the land of Israel, and I've had many occasions to eat in the home of Orthodox Jews and on Shabbat, as the two hollow loaves were brought out, representing the double portion of manna that fell from heaven, and that we would not need to be collecting manna the next day, but his provision is there for us. And as they said the blessing, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, homotzi lechem min haaretz. I of course know the Adonai is really Yehovah. I know that. And then as they took the cup and said, Baruch atah Yehovah, Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Barei pari ha'gofen. I would sit at that table and I would recognize and understand that what they are doing, this is what was done from the time that the Melech Zadik brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. And Yeshua said, this represents my body which is broken for you. This cup represents the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, wherever you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. The remembrance of them are all around. And this is what the Almighty put in place for us to understand. And this is why Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. We do this in remembrance of him. Shabbat Shalom. When you hear the name Ron Wyatt, it's inspiring, at least it was to me. Ron is the reason I'm sitting here at Shabbat Night Live. I was really inspired by the things that he discovered. I was always into Indiana Jones and that type of thing, but Ron was the original 
the real Indiana Jones to me. And there's a lot more stories about Ron uh, that you don't know. And this series on Shabbat Night Live, you're going to know a little bit more about those stories. Uh, because we have some very special guests today. Please welcome Mary Nell, Wyatt Lee, and Randall Lee. Welcome, guys, to Shabbat Night Live. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're here because, Mary, before Ron died, and what year did he die again? 99. 99. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked you to publish his works. Yes. And you have done so in a new book called Battle for the Firstborn. And this is what we're going to talk about here at Shabbat Night Live in this very special series. I'm very honored to be speaking to you. I, I told a couple of people before, I'm going to be speaking to Ron Wyatt's widow. Can you imagine? Aww. <laughs> so, Aww. I just thought that he is so, he really is, like, you know, you see uh, Harrison Ford on Indiana Jones and his movies, but Ron's the real guy. In fact, before we recorded here, I actually asked you guys if, if you know, somehow along the way that you thought Steven Spielberg used Ron's story for the movie because it's so closely related, but <laughs> it was not, it just happened simultaneously, yeah, really. It did. Now, there's a story here about uh, Mary, about, about you and, and Randall. So uh, people are wondering, okay, so I understand Mary Nell Wyatt, and I understand Ron Wyatt, and Randall Lee, where does Randall Lee come into this? So <laughs> if you guys could share your story, it's, it's a really endearing story. I want people to know how you all came together. And, and Randall, that you are still supporting the work of Ron uh, with Mary Nell. Uh, tell me how this all happened. Well, I guess the first thing to explain is how I ended up marrying Ron. And uh, back in 1988, I was a recommitted Christian. And at my work, one of the men in the office noticed a change in me. And so one time there was a snowstorm and I had to ride home with this man. And we're stuck in the snowstorm and he's driving his big old Cadillac. And he said, Mary Neal, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he said, do you really believe all that stuff in the Bible is true? And he said, I've been a deacon or elder in my church you know, as long as I can remember, I'm there every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, and I just have trouble with that. So I had been recommitted in my life. I was raised a Christian, but I had drifted away. And I was studying, um, I'm a show me person. I always have been, and I was reading books about history and archeology, span and I began bringing them to this man. And one day out of the blue, he said, oh, did I tell you, I know the man that found Noah's Ark. And I looked at him and I said, sure you do, because I would go to the Christian bookstore on my lunch hour, I had every book about everything. And I found, I had books about Noah's Ark, but there was nothing in there about it being found. And he called this man and said, uh, do you have any books? Because I said, does he have a book or anything? And he told this man, no, I don't. Well, on April 15th, a man, I worked for a stockbroker, and a man walked into the office, and he was dressed in polyester shirt and pants and big beard, and he was wrinkled from head to foot. And people like that didn't come into our office. So uh, it was kind of a laugh. I, I said to someone, that must be a friend of this man I'm talking about because he was kind of a jokester and had lots of interesting friends. And he did ask for this man. And pretty soon, my friend brought him up and said, I'd like for you to meet Ron Wyatt. This is the man who found Noah's Ark. And he stood in our office and talked for about two hours, as long as he had money on the parking meter, he said. And he told us about Noah's Ark, um, the Red Sea crossing. He knew where Mount Sinai was, um, all of these things. And then he talked about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what was so amazing was it was the first time in my life, I'd ever heard anybody talk about Jesus as real, as a personal friend of his. He, I mean, he talked about him, he came to life when he talked. I'd never heard anything like it and I was uh, amazed. Mm. And anyhow, he had to leave. And I immediately, when he said Noah's Ark had been found and had, had been accepted by the Turkish government. He said that was that it happened uh, maybe eight months before he walked in that door. 
And I began to try to get out to Noah's Ark. I wanted to go. And finally, I had to have uh, my friend call him and ask, where is it? I didn't know. The, the travel agents would laugh at me, and um, they didn't know anything about it. So he called Ron and said, I have a friend that you heard you talk, and they want to go to Noah's Ark. What is the town? Where do we get there? So my friend, who was an elderly man, he was sitting there writing these, spell that again. And finally he <laughs> said, can you talk to her? And handed me the phone. And I said, hello. And he said, oh, you're a girl. You, you can't go out there. It's mm. dangerous. And to make a long story short, he asked me, he said, I'm going on May 30th. And if you can afford it, if you can stay out of the way, and if you can take instructions, you can go with my group. I was blown away. So I said, I can go. And um, the next time I saw, no, he, he might have come in the office one time after that, but the next time I saw him was when I called him to find out uh, what kind of clothes, I needed things like that. He said, listen, I've got to go to Georgia and run some radar because one of the men um, that was going with us, his, he's not going to go and he was going to help me with the radar. And if you can go with me down there, I can show you, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So first time I've seen him alone, you know, and I'm in the car with him and we're riding it down to Georgia and he's just talking away and telling me about all his discoveries and I learned to work the radar. All I had to do was pull it. He was trying to teach me how to pull it at an even pace. And we're coming home and we're in the car and he's telling me his life story. And it was so sad that I began to cry. <laughs> I'm gonna cry right now when I think about it. And I'm sitting there and I, I was just 37. You know, I was young. And I said, why are you telling me this? And God is my witness. He said, because if we're going to be married, you need to know these things. Well, that's a little forward now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and he, ex he explained to me that he had prayed and asked God to send him someone. He said, because I've been doing this work all this time and I can't do it alone anymore. I need help. Hmm. It, it wasn't. You know, it was flat out like that. I didn't say anything, but we went on the trip uh, May 30th, came home a couple of weeks later and got married July the 5th. And I worked with him until the day he died. Hmm. And um, where Randall comes in, Yes, let's get to this. This is mm -hmm. Randall's the mystery in the corner over here. Where, where does Randall come in? Well, um, for four years, mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't. I kind of floundered around. I didn't know what to do. This was after Ron had passed. After Ron had yep. died, and um, one day, it was July fifth, my anniversary, my fourth anniversary since his death. I said a prayer. And by this time, I was no longer a 37-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how old was I? In uh, 52 or something like mm -hmm. that. And um, I prayed, if it's your will, Father, I, I would like someone. Uh, I don't like being alone. And that was July 5th. And on July the 10th, I met Randall in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We were doing some work over there and he was one of the volunteers. And at that time, Ron had already, I mean, Randall, I'll confuse him now. <laughs> Randall had already uh, gone out to Noah's Ark and spent a month out there. He knew all about Ron's work. Okay. And the things that, the one thing I asked when I said my prayer was, I said, I need, you know, all I ask is that he believe like I do in the Sabbath and things like that. Mm -hmm. And along came Randall. Wow. And he has helped me so much because my job was helping Ron. And now Ron has the two of us because he has sat there and studied. He, he has access to all the thousands of videos and photos and everything. And he has studied it. And, and like when I wrote this book right here, this was so hard 
And I had another friend, Scott Parvey, who would, would go over it and help me with it. But Randall was the one who would say, okay, you need to explain this better and blah, blah, blah. Very good. So I believe that I was supposed to work with Ron and mm -hmm. I believe that Randall was supposed to help finish. Wow. Yeah. Well, God works in mysterious ways, as they say, right? He does. That's right. And you know, this is not a small book. It's as thick as it looks. Yeah. This is 200 and what, 90 some pages? 200 and, okay, pretty close. 279 yeah. pages is where the index starts. So yeah. this is a very uh, significant book. We're gonna be talking about it in several episodes here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's beautiful how you guys work together and that, uh, Randall, that you were a fan of, of Ron's work and uh, that you're working now as a team is just a beautiful mm -hmm. thing to me. And so uh, I, I just... I'm honored to meet you both, so thank you for being here. Now, thank you. So, why was I mean? I guess the the, the title of this book is "The Battle for the Firstborn: The Exodus and the Death of Tutankhamen." Very intriguing title because uh, you know we're going to get into Tutankhamen later in, in a couple episodes from now, but uh, we want to start at the at the beginning here. And I guess my question is, you know, why was the Exodus? I mean, there's lots of other things to discover out there. Well, why was the Exodus so important to Ron? It was extremely important to him because the, as a Christian, uh, I run into so many people who say, I'm a Christian, I'm New Testament, I, you know, the Old Testament, that's for the Jews. But no, no, it's one story all the way through. And he understood that the significance of these things was absolutely as important as seeing the evidence. Uh, when God provided a safe haven for the children of Israel in Egypt, it was all leading up to the Messiah. And it was a situation where if it wasn't for what happened to the children of Israel in Egypt and them coming out and the things that, that transpired along the way, we wouldn't have Jesus. We wouldn't have um, we wouldn't have what we have today. It was part of a massive plan on the part of the Father and the Son for bringing salvation to all mankind. And you know, even mm -hmm. Moses' life, as uh, as we talked about when we were doing uh, planning these shows, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we all came to a realization that even Moses' childhood has a correlation to Yeshua that we did not even recognize until we met while planning out these shows, which we'll get into, which is really interesting as well. So that, mm -hmm. we're gonna save that, because that's a really neat nugget too. But <laughs> so, the, so the timing of the Exodus, you know, um, uh, Tim Mahoney had, has done a whole movie series on this, mm -hmm. uh, but is the timing of the Exodus off? I mean, why is everyone assuming it's one thing and, and is it another? Ron believed that it was uh, a case of a world view. Um, archaeology, science, scholarship world today, they base everything on man's science, their belief in science. And Ron believed it had to be based on the Bible. And you just, that's not accepted in the scholarly world. What he did is he, as he studied these things, and I want to say up front that I have no doubt that God called him to do this. And all of these things, I've heard many people say, Ron Wyatt said he found this and he found that. Come on, can one person do all that? No, one person can't do all that, but God can. And I lived with Ron and I know that all he cared about was people's salvation. Mm. He didn't have any vanity. He didn't have anything that he liked. We never did vacations, ever. We never did anything except this work because he was called to do it. And it's very important. I've had a lot of people say, I don't need this. But yes, you do, because times are coming when not only is it going to be tough times and we're going to need a faith like like the children of Israel needed when they went through the Red Sea. We're gonna need that. And God is providing for the people who say, just show me something. He wants to save everyone, not just, you know, this one and that one. And 
So it's very important. It's a very important work, and God saved it for this generation because he's coming soon. Mm. And I think the thing about this book, as I was writing it, it took me 32 years. Back in 1998, when Ron first married me, he gave me a job. My first assignment was he told me his beliefs about what dynasty it was, what year it happened, who were the people in Egypt, who were they, can we see who they were, can we learn more about their life? And I began a, a search that took a long, long time. I could have written the book before this, but it was so difficult that it took COVID <laughs> to get <laughs> took me quarantine started. To write it the Bible, took quarantine, to write, write, yes. Well, the, the, the Bible of the story. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of beautiful pictures in here. I mean, this is the thing that we're gonna, we're gonna share some of these photos as we go through the series okay. uh, with folks. Uh, you even have some videos. Yes. Which, that is a, a great thing we want to promote right now is that there is actually uh, some bonus material that we're gonna <laughs> share on here. Some videos if we get to them during the series here, but some we're mm -hmm. gonna just keep for uh, the bonus. And so that's gonna be only on the michaelrood.tv app. And that's where mm -hmm. all these videos, and the videos you've spoken about are videos I've never heard of. I mean, has no, anybody they're, they're, seen No, they're these? new, yeah, I mean, wow. they're not new. Um, I've got a lot of videos of Ron from even um, late 70s, um, 80s, and um, then I sat him down once we realized he was dying, mm -hmm. once the doctor said there's nothing else we can do for your cancer. I sat him down and had a friend ask him questions. And so I've got little snippets of his answers that pertain to this. And so um, I've got him all through his work. And I just think that uh, it's, you've got this beautiful photography on here showing all the Noah's Ark, Mount Sinai, the Red Sea crossing and everything. But these are the beginnings, these are the, the very early parts when uh, some of them are eight millimeter film because he didn't have a, a camcorder. Mm, beautiful, I can't wait to see those. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've got only two minutes left here before we go to a break, so I, I, I just wanna like, uh, we're gonna just go to a break right now because okay. I think the next thing I wanna ask you, uh, we don't wanna cut it short. Okay. So we're gonna go into a break right now. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for being here and I wanna thank you for watching ShabbatNet Live because guess what? You are the only one that makes this thing happen. We don't have any corporate sponsors. You are the one that makes it happen. And you are responsible for bringing uh, Mary Nell and for bringing Randall here. And we wanna thank you very much for, being, for doing that not only for your, so you can see it, so that other people can see it as well. And so the fact that you are watching tonight, you have the opportunity to make things happen for folks down the line. Just how Mary Nell and Randall have continued the work of Ron Wyatt, you guys can continue what we're doing here on Shabbat Night Live for other people. And all it takes is a donation to this ministry because with donations, we can keep going. We can keep showing this to other people. It can go to folks you don't even know are going to see this into the future. You can have uh, a reward on the sea of fire and glass, as Michael calls it, <laughs> that you are not even aware of simply because you gave to a ministry that provided the truth for that person to learn and maybe found Messiah for the first time. So I would invite you to do that right now. We're gonna give you a couple minutes. Think about it, pray about it. Thank you in advance, and we'll see you in a couple minutes.
And thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live and the Root Awakening International and Michael Root, of course. And uh, Randall, you just told me during the break here that if it was not for Michael Rood, you and Mary Nell would never have met. What is this all about? Well, I went to a meeting in Dallas in 1998, I believe it was, and Michael was passing around the uh, Gomorrah sulfur balls ah. and having a meeting telling about the Ron's discoveries and, and about his teachings. And at the end, I went back and they had a tape back there telling about Ron Wyatt with all these discoveries. And I didn't really know what it was, but I thought, that sounds pretty interesting. I just don't know what it is. So I bought the tape, uh, VHS, mm -hmm. and took it home. And I don't watch TV that much, so I just put it on top of my TV. And I, I probably didn't watch it for four months. But I finally looked at it, and I was like, I've got to go see this, you know? Oh, this is really interesting. So I ended up, it took me a while to get there, but I, in 2001, I, in July of 2001, I went to Noah's Ark by myself. And I got there and I realized I didn't really know where it was or anything, but uh, it, I just remember what was on the tape and, and stumbled around and finally found it. And so I got involved with uh, the website of, of a friend of mine in Dallas that said, let's, let's go on this dig. They're doing a dig in Jerusalem in uh, 2003 and I, we could be on the team. I said, okay, let's do it. And so we showed up and that's, I met Mary Nell at the airport in Jerusalem. Wow, <laughs> that is neat. I, I didn't know that before, literally before during the break, you just told us about that. That is yeah. a fabulous story. That's, well, we are honored to be a part of your relationship. That is wonderful. Now, uh, let's get back to what we were talking about here a second ago. So we're, we're obviously heading toward Egypt and uh, you know the firstborn with the Exodus and, and mm -hmm. Passover and all that kind of thing. So, but that, the story doesn't start there. The story actually starts with Egypt. Where do we start with Egypt in the Bible? And the first mention of Egypt is with Abram before he's even Abraham, Right. Abram and Sarai. So mm -hmm. how does this tie in? Well, the first mention like you said, of Egypt in the Bible is when Abram goes down there because of a, a um, you know, of a, there's just not enough a food. famine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And he gets down there and apparently Sarai was one beautiful woman because the Pharaoh said, you know, I'm taking this woman. She's absolutely beautiful. And he paid Abraham, a, a, I mean, Abram at that time, a good price but things began to happen. We're not really told the extent of it, but it was probably some pretty bad plagues and the king knew something was up. And that's when he said, what's happening? And found out that Abraham had lied to him, that yes, Sarah, Sarai was his sister, but she was also his wife. And the king had given, or the pharaoh, when I say king, I mean the pharaoh had given Abram a lot of money for her. And he said, look, take your wife, keep the money, but leave. <laughs> and so he left, and I'm sure everything got back to normal wow. in Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Okay, if mm -hmm. people are putting the pieces together in their heads, I'm sure, going, wait a minute, so let my people go. Instead of that, it's like, get out of here. Yes. <laughs> Number one. And take your people with you. Take your you. people with you. <laughs> yeah. Number one, and it's a pharaoh. I wonder how many people put that in their heads. Wait a minute, this was a pharaoh of Egypt mm -hmm. that this happened with as well. Right. Uh, and there, there's just so many correlations. The plagues, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you think about it that way, uh, right. that things started, you said things started happening, but if you think about it, wait a minute, these were plagues. Yeah. This is a precursor to Passover. Mm -hmm. This is what happened when the Israelites were in captivity. Yeah. This is amazing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to find, I think, that mm -hmm. as we go through this series, that there are several correlations like this, that the Bible mm -hmm. is cyclical. You know, whereas in Greek thought, we think, okay, one thing happens and the next thing happens and the next thing happens. And when you think that way, you miss a lot of the ebb and flow of the Bible. You don't see that it's almost like the, I keep drawing the symbol with my hands, it's almost like the yeah. eternal symbol, right? It's like mm -hmm. Hebrew goes in cycles. You know, that's why you do the feasts every year and you learn something new every year and you go through, you know, some people read uh, the, the Torah every year mm -hmm. and, you, and it's just, there are things that get fulfilled and they get fulfilled a different way and fulfilled another way and it's not just fulfilled once and that's it. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting way that, that God interweaves all of these things and so uh, we want to go to the next step in that story, and that's uh, Joseph. 
Yes. When we, so we think of uh, this whole story and we get to Abraham, Isaac, and mm -hmm. Joseph, uh, and then we get to uh, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, mm -hmm. and then Joseph, of course. Uh, is he Imhotep? Have we have heard from, from other yes, sources? Yes, that's what Ron uh, believed, and everything that I will be saying is Ron's, uh, that's my job, is to, you know, uh, tell his research mm -hmm. and what he's found. He spent a lot of time in Egypt, a lot of time, and he loved it there because there's so much history there. And when he went to the Step Pyramid Complex, what he saw there was a perfect picture of a grain distribution center. And it was, um, I, I've got a lot about that in this book. And the interesting, one of the first interesting things about it is that Imhotep was the first person in Egypt to be described first or rather second under the king. And it's right on, and as you can see on this photo, this is on the base of Zoser, Pharaoh Zoser's, um, you know, a, a, a thing that they found. The whole mm -hmm. statue's not there, but his feet are there in his name. And then underneath, Imhotep, second under the king. Mm. And we know that's exactly what happened when the Pharaoh said, uh, because of your wisdom and all of this, I'm putting you second in my kingdom. Everyone is subject to you. Now there are some, we're gonna get into this a little bit later, so is, uh, because there are some things we find in Egyptology that are, we think are names, mm -hmm. and this is where some confusion comes in, and we're gonna straighten that out in this series, but is in Imhotep a name or is it a title? Well, that's an interesting thing. Um, he, did, he did not come to the throne. He did not become a pharaoh, so all of their names, uh, just like biblical names, reflected a God, you know. And um, that's just like, uh, especially in Hebrew, um, all the names have a meaning. And I don't really understand uh, Imhotep, except we know that Hotep means the mouth or the voice of. Mm. And interestingly, M is spelled I am, it could be I am, but it doesn't transliterate out that way. But Ron thought, how interesting, it sounds like the mouth or the voice of I am. And I'm, I'm, let me stress, I'm not saying that because it, not only does Egyptian have to be translated, it has to be um, transliterated. It's a two-step process, and I couldn't begin to understand it. But the, the interesting thing, and we can, we'll be, you can see right here on the screen, there was a complex, a veritable city within a city that had the step pyramid, mm -hmm. which was the first pyramid ever built in Egypt. And um, then this huge complex is walled and there is only one entrance. Hmm. You go through this fair stairway, not a stairway, this walkway, and on either side of it are 42 different stalls. And Ron, the first time he saw it, he thought this would be a perfect place for people coming to buy grain of different language groups. They could say, now where, where's the guy that speaks my language? Pay their money, uh -huh. get their sack, go right through there and in, exit out into this area and there are grain bins humongous grain bins. Mm. I know it's not a very scientific word, but they're huge. And there's one main one, and then all of the others have chutes that funnel into that one. And in ancient Egypt, you see every city eventually had grain bins, but they would usually, for each city, they would just have one. And this was an, a massive amount of grain. And it was just... Um, I mean, Ron had no doubt that this was it. Mm. And the interesting thing about the Step Pyramid is that history records, uh, ancient history records that Imhotep was the architect of the first pyramid in Egypt. And um, so that led to Ron being very fascinated with how the pyramids were built. 
Another interesting thing about Saqqara, remember I said it only had one entrance. Well, it also had an exit. In this video, you can see there's stairs right here that are going down and exit out so that people did not, you didn't have two-way traffic going back through that one entrance that I told you about. They would go down these steps, take their grain after they'd been given it and gone out. And so that led to Ron being uh, very interested in this center, and, but then he also became very interested in how the pyramids were built when he realized that about uh, Imhotep. And he was in Saqqara, there's other tombs around there, and he was studying them, and this was back before they shut down so many things that you can't see out there. And he found these hieroglyphs, as you can see on the screen. This hieroglyph is still in use um, all through ancient Egypt, but he found some that had more detail in them, and they looked like they portrayed a part or a piece of a, a piece of machinery. And then when he read what Herodotus said about how the pyramids were built, and he said they built them in steps or terraces or tiers, and this machine was used which would raise the blocks from one level to the next. And then when Ron saw this, this hieroglyph that looked like a device, he started thinking, and this is a case where I believe God gave him insight. And he built this device. And... So Ron built one of his own. He built many of them. And he started out with small ones. And once he got the device to work, as you can see on the screen, uh, by using nothing but wood and ropes, four people in this, in, in this particular segment right here, four people can be seen raising an automobile. It's a small automobile, wow. but later on, after we got married, he built one um, and put our van on it. And I was scared to death. <laughs> I said, please don't tear up our car. <laughs> but four, four people, you know, he built that and four people lifted it and he did talk to an engineer who told him that based on this leverage method and uh, using ropes, even though it's wood, um, Ron is, is in the video that you'll include saying that this uh, engineer said that it could lift up to 500 tons. Wow. In the right proportions. Okay. And then he also noticed as he studied, like I said, he spent a lot of time in Egypt and he saw, as you see on the screen, these holes around the foot of the pyramid. And he said, um, these are just the right spacing and place to put the feet of the pyramid building machines to lift the device, to lift the stones. And then as you lift them to the next tier, you just lift the machine up, put it on the next terrace and continue to lift all the way up. Interesting, well that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. now, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so does the uh, description of the, the stalls that you mentioned as yes. people were filing through. It almost sounds like a grocery store, yes. uh, the check stands doesn't yep. it? Mm -hmm. And people just going through, mm -hmm. you come in one way, grab your grain, pay for it, go out, and that would make perfect sense that they would have so many for either many different languages or just the volume of people. Right. And you go to your, you know, mm -hmm. check stand number one or two or three or four or five, which one or whatever yes. it was. And, yeah. And you know, you see pictures of that area. I mean, uh, now there have been many, many uh, proofs of this through many different people doing videos and photographs of this kind of thing. It's pretty obvious that that's what this yes. area was used for, mm -hmm. if they didn't even believe Ron. But I mean, they yeah. should, because now you have photographs in this uh, book that we can see right mm -hmm. here on the stage mm -hmm. uh, and on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's amazing stuff. Okay, well, we're gonna get into another uh, piece of information here that I don't think a lot of people realize, because I didn't, okay. uh, that in Egypt, uh, at the time of the Hebrews, there was another group Mm -hmm. And they were Semitic, yes. just like the Hebrews, and they were called the Hyksos. Yes. Tell us about the Hyksos. Well, let's use a little common sense here. If my family was given a bunch of land, I mean a whole bunch of land up in the Cumberland Plateau or something like that, and a bunch of our cousins say, hey, you got all this great land, can we come? They're not gonna say no. So it appears 
because we know that the Hyksos were Semitic, it appears that relatives of, you know, the children of, of Jacob, the children of Israel, uh, came to live in the same area. And what happened is they were, there, there's a lot of tales out there and historians who write that they were bad and Egypt had to kick them out. And they did, they did. But the, the Hyksos were very advanced. Um, when Manfred Biotech began studying and doing excavations at Avaris, which is in the Delta nearby, they found a very sophisticated city. It had just, this is just one city, one Hyksos city. And I believe that the population was probably about 25,000 on up. And they built them on the, uh, the little tributaries of the little rivers coming off of the Nile. So they trade right to the Mediterranean. And then they had trade coming in. They had a thriving um, business of commerce and, and they knew a whole lot about technology. And so what happened with the Hyksos is they contributed greatly to Egypt's advancement in warfare especially mm. because they brought the war chariot that's their invention. Yes. Even though Joseph had a chariot and the other and his pharaoh had a chariot, they were not in use in war. There was no chariot troops until after the Hyksos were kicked out of the country. And right at uh, there's a funny story tell it explains all of that in the book very well. Um, the there's a story about we have in North Egypt, up here, the Hyksos living, and we have in Thebes down here in, in uh, South, the traditional Egyptian, you know, native ruler. And they found um, a papyrus or a story about the king up here in the North, the Hyksos, writing to this king and saying, your hippopotami are keeping me awake. You need to do something about them. <laughs> now there's 375 miles difference. But so that really riled the guy down here. And he said, I'm, I'm kicking them out. They don't belong here anyhow. And so uh, his name, was, the first one's name was Sinkin Ray, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And they found his mummy. And as you can see on the screen, he shows uh, evidence of gruesome injuries. He died mm. obviously in war and he did not kick the Hyksos out. He lost that battle. But then his son, I believe it was his son's name was Kamosa, and Kamosa continued, and uh, he did uh, make headway. But then finally, it was his son, Amosa. I hope I'm getting these names right. Wait just a minute. <laughs> well, that's what the book it's is It's possible, for. Well, yeah, yeah. You're gonna have to get the book because I, it, there's so much there's here. A lot of I can't remember Absolutely. it all. No, that's fine. But anyhow, his son, let's see, after three, who was Amosa, yes. Yeah. It was Amosa who finally expelled the Hyksos. And he, he did a very clever thing. Instead of doing like the first two and going up there and trying to attack Avaris, what he did is he went up there and set a siege between Avaris and the military uh, wall up here where they could no longer get supplies. They couldn't come and go. Mm. And so he conquered them and he made them leave. And... Um, the interesting thing is, is that they all left, but the Israelites stayed. Hmm. Now, why did the Israelites get to stay? Because Joseph's Pharaoh had given them that land forever. Remember? Ah, uh, yes, okay. And so there so, was a deed to the land here. Yes, <laughs> and uh, in this, in this um, famine stele, as you can see right here, it tells the story of many years later, probably a thousand years later, where these, um, these two um, priests, well, uh, these, this priesthood, I don't know how many it was, they were claiming land based on King Joseph's promise to the priesthood. Hmm. But in that, they also talk about the famine and all its evidence of the story of Joseph and the story includes the name of the Pharaoh, whose name was Joser, 
who was the king the, or the pharaoh or the emperor who built the step pyramid. Wow. There's a lot of evidence, and I've tried to document all of it in here so that anybody who reads it can see that it's well documented. And Josephus mentions these people as well, right? Yes. He mentions them as the uh, as shepherds or something. Oh, he's effect, the one right? who depicted them in such a bad light mm. and made them seem like bad people. But I don't, I think that they were a blessing to Egypt in the long run. Mm. Well, definitely they are. I mean, they, it seems the Egyptians learned a lot from them. And in fact, there are some things that are credited to the Egyptians that we know the Hebrews came up with first. Yes. So <laughs> apparently the Egyptians were quite apt at uh, taking ideas from those who lived on their land and just claiming it as their own. So <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, why not, right? <laughs> They're the boss, they own they, the land, so why not? They lived rent-free, so we're gonna take your technology. Now we're gonna get into something very interesting mm -hmm. that uh, several uh, others have, have hinged on, but I think that uh, you've got it right on the head, and that mm -hmm. is the 18th dynasty incorrectly calculated. There's a timeline here that's missing, yeah. uh, and it, it's, it's incorrect. And we're gonna get into that on the next episode. Okay. So would you come back and share that with us? Sure. Okay, great, we'll get into that next time. And thank you for joining us on Shabbat Night Live. I am very intrigued by this, I hope you are too. And if you wanna get the book, Battle for the Firstborn, you can get it at ronwyatt.com. It's as simple as that. You can get that and bless uh, Randall and Mary Nell uh, Wyatt Lee for being here with us today. And we wanna thank you for being with us, and we will see you next time on Shabbat Night Live. Until then, Shavua Tov and Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new MichaelRood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.